it is so refreshing to have gone out and finally <laughs> cut off all my hair. <laughs> I'm so glad that we finally got some 70 degree weather so that I could just buzz off all my hair that was keeping me warm. Now I get this little chill. Man, now I know why they call them rednecks because, you know, they get sunburn on their neck. <laughs> but seriously, you know, if you don't take the time to stop what you're doing and smell whatever those are, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't make the time to look around at what God has given you, you'll take it for granted. You see, the children of Israel, once they had gotten into the land, they were blessed and prospered because God had given them a goodly land. He had given them his law. He had put that law in their hearts. They had developed into a society that would once again influence the world and would be so blessed by him that they would never be assimilated into any other culture. Although they really are, but we'll get there in some point in time and discuss how the Jewish culture really is assimilated. But the point of it is, is that there was always a distinction that was unique unto the people of God that he chose for them to be his peculiar people, the Father. And as such, God caused them when they failed to come back to him, when they rebelled to be brought back to him. One way or another, God always brought back his people to himself. Because they didn't appreciate the blessings of God that they had. They were taken into captivity, into Babylon, where they suffered under Babylonian captivity. Not to the evil degree with which some people think, but rather with being in a culture that was foreign to them. They were not Babylonian. They were not Persian or Iranian. They were Jewish. But they lived underneath that covering of the king's protection as they had been brought out 490 years approximately, 400 years before 90 about, into Babylonian captivity because they did not appreciate the land that God had given them. Sometimes in America, we forget that. We forget that we haven't been around even 200 years, maybe 250 at most. But even that, we haven't been around long enough to be whining about what we got or complaining that we're somehow some post-Christian era. No, we're not. We're still a Christian nation that God has blessed and caused His grace to shine upon. We still have a Christian president, whether you accept it or not, doesn't matter. The fact that he goes to church makes him a Christian. Because whether he is born again is a choice between himself and God alone, not me or you to decide. But the fact that he goes to church, and it's a Christian church, makes him part of the Christian religion. So you see, there's an aspect of whining and complaining, murmuring that's going on in America that's unrighteous and ungodly. It's not something that God honors or God will allow to go on much longer. Because he will bring every nation to its knees eventually for not doing or appreciating the things that God has given. Me? Hey, I don't worry about the nation. That's God's department. What I really care about, what I really share about, from my heart to yours is this. From my heart to your heart, from my lips to your ears, that we would see Jesus. That I would know Jesus. That you would know God. In a personal and intimate way, sharing and caring about the things that are important to you today. Not the big things that get so easy to say, we, us, them, and blame and shame and argue about who's at fault and who isn't. I have no idea what's causing the nations to do what they do. God does. God has decreed sometimes even curses and blessings and choices that were made previous to when I was born that are still going on today in this nation as well as to the children of Israel that are in Israel today. There's a plan that God has for the entire universe that's going to be accomplished. But you know, I'm not so concerned about that because I've already read about it and I already know how it all works out. It's not just we win in the end, no, because it's tough 
and it's rough and it's going to get worse and it's getting bad and it's going to get tougher and rougher and it's going to get worse. But you know, I have plants that if I put these plants, you know, in a hothouse and I grow hothouse plants, they, they seem to be, you know, nice and they grow. But you know, a plant that's weathered the storms, that has gone through the chill, that has gone through the sunlight, the heat, the cold, you know, develops strong roots. It sinks its roots down into the soil and it sucks up all the nutrients that it can. Because once the wind blows and the stalk starts weaving back and forth, those roots start clinging and they start going down deeper in order to hold the plant in place. Be amazed at how growth goes on. Even when a plant falls over, it'll grow back up. Trees do that a lot. If you've ever seen a tree blown down, if some of its roots are still in the ground, that tree will still grow. It'll even send out shoots from the main stalk trying to grow straight up. That's what you need to be like. Irregardless of what you think about the world and its ways, the nations or the government or the churches or the politics, you need to focus in on your personal relationship with God. To sit back at the end of your day, to look around and be able to say, thank you for another day. Thank you that I can see what you have given me. Thank you for my job or my wife. Thank you for my car or my life. Thank you for my children or my home. Thank you for my apartment or thank you for my poverty. Thank you for my disease. Thank you for the fact that I'm dying, but and yet I live. Thank you for all things that you brought to me this day. For God, had you not brought it to me, I would worry and think that, oh no, circumstances are out of control. But since you are the Lord God of all, I can trust you for everything and in everything give thanks. For I know, O oh God, this is your will, according to what you have said that I should do. Because like your children of Israel in the promised land when they finally entered in and were not thankful nor grateful but murmured and complained and you sent them into captivity. I know God you could do the same with me. So Father, help me to be thankful for each new day, for each and every day that I'm still alive and I have one more chance to see what you will do in a new day even as I end this day and I give you all the glory and praise for what was done today in the name of the Son. It's a tragedy that men do not know that God is here. Tozer, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. Genesis 28, 16. Did you know that God is where you are? Do you know that God is in you? Do you know God, really? And that's what it boils down to. I personally have taken my wife on a journey that we call life, day by day. And sometimes it frustrates her a little bit because I talk all the time about it everywhere we go. I point out things that happen between God and I that are obvious, that they cannot be circumstantial, but that they are obviously God's working something out to show me he's still moving in my life. He's doing things that bless my socks off, little things. Oh, we could say the parking space is like some, you know, mystical, gimmicky thing. But no, I'm talking about every day, whether it be a hummingbird at the right time, or I talk about the wind and the wind blows, or plants, and just all kinds of weird things that are unique and distinctive to me, or the miracles that happen in my life. My wife has seen those things happen daily, and she's begun to realize that God's real. And though she may have doubts at times with her own personal relationship, you know, as far as she knows she's a Christian and knows she's saved, she doesn't, you know, experience all the fullness that God is yet willing to bestow upon her as she just let go and let God and fulfill her destiny as a child of God, that he would want to reveal all that he's doing of the things that she can see if she just had eyes to see what the Spirit of God is doing and moving in her life, like I do. And that's what Jacob discovered, was that God was moving in his life. Jacob discovered, whoa, even here when I was running away from God, God is here. And he didn't know it. The patriarch Jacob saw a vision of God and cried out in wonder, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. Jacob had never been one small division of it. Jacob had never been for one small division of a moment outside the circle of that all-pervading presence. But he knew it not. 
That was his trouble, and it is ours. We think we're outside of God's presence when God is always there and we are in his presence. Men do not know that God is here and God is there. You could say God is everywhere, but God is in his throne and the kingdom of heaven is about us. What a difference it would make if they knew. The presence of God and the manifestation of the presence of God are not the same. When God reveals himself, he reveals himself in his own way, in his own choice, even as the Spirit does and as Jesus does. There can be the one without the other. God is here when we are wholly unaware of it. He is the unseen presence, an unknowable God, the unsearchable beyond all measure of existence that we cannot conceive of, and yet, when he limits himself, we can't perceive him. On our parts, there must be surrender to the Spirit of God, for his work is to show us the Father and the Son. As we are yielded to God's Spirit, as the Holy Spirit works in our life, he opens our eyes to see God. He opens our ears to hear God. He opens the mind of our understanding to know God. For without him, we cannot see, hear, or know God at all. If we cooperate with him in loving obedience, God will manifest himself to us. And in that manifestation will be the difference between a nominal, token Christian life and a life radiant with the light of his presence and his countenance upon our face. We will, as it were, light up when you mention the name of Jesus. It has been asked, why does God manifest his presence to some and let multitudes of others struggle along in half-light of imperfect Christian experience? We can only reply that the will of God is the same for all, that you would know the Father and you would know the Son. That's God's will for your life. Jesus said it himself, this is life eternal, that they should know you, the Father, and know him whom you have sent, the Son. That's what eternal life is all about, getting to know God the Father, getting to know God the Son. That's what the Holy Spirit is here for. It's not to give you gifts and benefits and all these other things that people use and abuse and sometimes confuse. It is to see Jesus. It is to know God. It is to walk with him in his spirit. He has no favorites within his household. All he has ever done for any of his children, he will do for all of his children. The difference lies not with God, but with us. Have you limited God in some way in your understanding or your perspective of the realization of knowing God in a personal intimate way? Have you denied that you can hear his voice by thinking that you have to read the Bible and that's the way you hear his voice? I have news for you. God speaks. God can be heard. God can be known. Jesus said it himself. And if you're denying that, you're denying the very presence of the Holy Spirit in your life that wants to cause you to have ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say to you. It's not understanding in some way that you go, huh, well, if I think about it, I'll make my thought life into his life and I'll be the mind of Christ and I'll have the Spirit of God and I'll just work the two together so that somehow it'll become his thoughts and not my thoughts and I'll say that his, that's his voice. Great. Thought life is not hearing. It is true to a certain degree that you could put on the mind of Christ and have God speak to you internally in some ways through the programming of your mind that you might prove what is acceptable the will of God in Christ Jesus as you renew your mind, but you don't negate the volume of Scripture for the perspective of an individual occasion of Scripture. The volume of Scripture fulfills the volume of Scripture. There is a place where God speaks and we hear. There is a place where God speaks in a still small voice and we hear. There is a place where God uses circumstances and we know. There is a place where God uses people and we hear. There is a place where God uses prophets and teachers and pastors and elders and deacons and all the other things that you come up with when you say that you feel like God is here. But at the same time, don't limit God with what he can do. Because one thing you're going to discover about God, he's gone. That means he has no limits.